So welcome again. We are here with Peter Coyote and Gary Camilla. Uh, Gary is the author. <laughs> Gary is the author of Cool Gray City of Love, which won the 2013 Northern California Book Award. He's the co-founder of Salon, and he's also the executive editor of San Francisco Magazine and writes a we weekly history column for the San Francisco Chronicle. Yes, I know, right? It's great. <laughs> um, Peter Coyote's new memoir, The Rain Man's Third Cure, An Irregular Education, is the tale of a young man caught between forces of ecstatic love and worldly power. The journey leads him through Greenwich Village jazz bars, government service, and stage and screen, and ultimately deep into Zen. Please welcome Gary Camilla and Peter Coyote. You forgot jail, Shimmy. <laughs> jail. Uh, well, I'm uh, just delighted and honored to be uh, here having a chance to uh, chat with Peter about his wonderful new memoir. It's a terrific book. Uh, as anyone who's read his earlier memoir or knows Peter or has followed his very varied life and career, he's a remarkable man of many, many hats and many... Uh, incarnations, and he touches on many of them in this book. And I think, Peter, uh, we're going to start out by uh, having you read a, a passage uh, from, from your new book. I'll read a little bit. Uh, you don't understand what an act of courage it is to be at a table when someone mentions an actor having written his second memoir. <laughs> <laughs> the first one usually brings up something akin to Samuel Johnson's talking dog. It's not that it does it well, but that he does it at all. <laughs> and that was true of neither of his memoirs. No. However, I'm going to read you something about sort of the last important film I did, just a little bit, six or seven minutes, because I don't want to waste time with, with Gary. It was about my one night as an international movie star. <clears throat> <clears throat> By 1987, after an apprenticeship of small films and pretty fair movies for television, 22 in all, I began to land important commercial roles. E.T., The Extraterrestrial, Outrageous Fortune, Cross Creek, The Legend of Billie Jean, and a breakthrough film in European markets named A Man in Love. I'd become a bona fide movie star. I don't mean the third tier old what's-his-name status my post-60 American career has settled into, I mean the generally accepted definition of a movie star, with billboards, posters on the street, full-page photos, and my face on the cover of magazines. It's true that the grandest of these stellar victories occurred in Europe and not in my home country, but I didn't care. I might not have been the brightest star in the Milky Way, but I was a star and definitely sharing the same constellation with the brightest. On a dazzling afternoon in May of that year, I was being photographed on the red carpet that extended from the very top of the Palais des Festivals in Cannes, France, where my new French film, A Man in Love, Un Homme Amoureux, was chosen as the opening event for the festival's 40th anniversary birthday party. The carpet cascaded down broad tiered steps and along 100 feet of the gorgeous seaside walkway called La Croisette. The tall, glistening palms, the highlights sparkling off the chrome fixtures of luxury yachts, the shimmering oceans, the white plastered buildings and ochre tiled roofs, all bathed in the vivid Mediterranean light that has attracted plein air painters since artists first blinked in it after crawling out from the caves of Lascaux and Chauvet. <laughs> off to one side, starlets were posing, hair tossing, smiling and baring their breasts, to attract the attention of photographers. This day, I didn't have to resort to any of the cheesy numbers all actors must capitulate to at times. I was 46 years old and appeared to be in my late 30s. I was starring in an A film, opening the most celebrated film festival in the world. Other than the opportunity to earn a living, acting, and particularly celebrity status, did not compel me over much. It would be an egregious lie to pretend that being on top, sought out, plied with inordinate attention, gifts, and privileges was not better than a sharp stick in the eye. 
and that I did not appreciate that the alpha wolf never has to roll over. But perhaps because I began acting so late in life, I understood that my shelf life would be brief. I could never take it all quite as seriously as I should have if I wanted to achieve maximal advantage to my career. The gyroscope that kept my head level even then was that I thought of myself as a writer who earned his living as an actor. Only a few years after that stellar evening at Cannes, audiences would repay my tepid regard for my livelihood with their own ho-hum estimation. But that day of reckoning was yet to arrive. I had made it through the portal of movie land well before my five-year deadline had expired. My luck had been that the crop of leading ladies edging toward that certain age had devised a survival strategy to perform alongside older men. Their insecurity, or valid instinct, had allowed me to play opposite interesting and formidable actresses, Tuesday Weld, Ellen Burstyn, Jamie Lee Curtis, Bette Midler, Jean Smart, Sharon Stone, Greta Scacchi, and Claudia Cardinale, all gifted, attractive women but all teetering around the chasm into which so many actresses are heartlessly pitched as they age beyond the interest of insecure men. <laughs> Berkeley, we love it. <laughs> I'd begun my film career seven years earlier, and now at 46, I was perched on an unimaginable crest. Wherever I looked that evening, I saw deities of cinema ambling by, smiling, saluting well-wishers and friends. Wim Wenders, Robert Altman, Barbe Schroeder, Paul Newman, Nikita Mikhailkov, Stephen Frears, Louis Mal, many others who had films in competition or on display that year. They made up the crowd that I stood among, and that night I dared to think of them as peers. Perhaps I could be forgiven the effrontery of believing that I had entered the pantheon of the gods if I had known then that I had only been granted a day pass. Standing atop those steps, looking down at the world from my temporary elevation above the ordinary, I felt a pang that my fa father had not lived to see me sober, healthy, and successful. I missed his laugh, I missed his worldly wisdom, and needed his guidance. His and my mother's losses are abiding sorrows that visit from time to time, compounded by the bitter knowledge that the consequences of errors can be irremediable. I had doubled down on my life by then, sliding all my chips forward to bet on normalcy, a wife and family and the sanity of Zen practice. I had radically curtailed my indulgent, self-destructive behavior, but I was not yet certain that they were firmly cast in the stone of habit. 10 or 15 years earlier, acting on impulse was simultaneous with the first blush of that impulse. Reflection or hesitation was never considered. On this magical can night, however, I knew that I no longer possessed the emotional reserves to overspend my energy as I once had, or could guarantee the time to rebuild what I would lose by surrendering to the wrong desires. I was clinging to an idea of sanity as my only refuge from chaos and death, both of which felt as if they were biding their time, waiting for my first false step. That's a good place to stop. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think that uh, the passage that Peter just read uh, amply demonstrates that this is not a dog that you marvel uh, at the fact that it does it. This is a, a, a very, uh, a, a really terrifically complicated uh, work of self-exploration. And on that theme, I guess the obvious question, now that we've dispensed with any embarrassment about having written two memoirs, is what led you, having written one acclaimed memoir, uh, Standing Where I Fall, which, uh, sleep, sorry, Sleeping Where I Fall, which is a, you know, a really seminal text for understanding the 1960s, the counterculture, um, why was it that you uh, returned and wrote a second memoir almost 20 years later? I got older. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, for lack of a better definition, we call them memoirs. But actually, Sleeping Where I Fall was about an era. And my life was kind of the organizing principle of it. If you imagine a string going through a necklace, 
there was, the book was actually about all these other characters and people that I lived with and enough of my own life story to explain how a upper middle class Jewish guy winds up shooting heroin in the back of a truck living without electricity. So it's become kind of a go-to source text for 60s studies. But I survived the 60s, and I survived the entire century. And uh, <laughs> as I did that, I, um, I realized that I was looking back on a lot of things differently. And um, the first, well, any writer in the audience will understand this. The first three drafts of this book were actually a political screed. Um, there was, it was designed to drive a stake through the heart of any number of lies that the culture tells itself. It was called Lies We Like to Believe. And I spent a year and a half in the library, and each chapter was like a hickory stake. Nuclear power, cheap, safe, and green. Wham! We love our children, a survey of the education system we give them. Wham! And so I wrote it, and I circulated among my closest circle of readers and most trusted friends, and they were completely unanimous in hating it. <laughs> <laughs> Three drafts hated it. And finally, uh, a very smart agent named Bonnie Solo said to me, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to win over or make the argument on Rush Limbaugh's readers and followers. You're trying to blow them out of the box. But they're not going to even accept your sources. They're not going to accept the New York Review of Books or, you know, Noam Chomsky. Or the, the, <laughs> it's not going to happen. <clears throat> she said, we write books for our people. And we don't know how big our community is until we publish the book. And it actually liberated me. And so I looked back at all the stories in the book, and I, I realized <clears throat> that there was a connection. There was actually a journey. So I don't know if you know, but the title comes from a Dylan song. In uh, the 60s, Dylan wrote this song called Stuck Inside of Mobile with the Memphis Blues Again. And there was a verse that went, the rain man gave me two cures. And he said, jump right in. The one was Texas medicine, and the other was railroad gin. <clears throat> and I thought about that. And I didn't know what Dylan meant, but for me, Texas medicine had to be peyote. And so I decided to make it a trope for the world of the ecstatic, the collaborative, the collective, the world of love. And railroad gin had to be the go juice of the robber barons, men and women who compete for material wealth and status and power. And so when I was young, I thought those were the options, love and power. And the trick was to get the mix right that love without power was flaccid, and power without love was fascism or vicious. And then about halfway through, I got introduced to the wisdom tradition. I got introduced to Zen Buddhism, and I began to practice it. And as that practice deepened, I actually realized that the other two are not cures at all. And so the book carries through to the decision that I made <clears throat> to pitch my tent in the camp of wisdom to stay as close to it as I could and to realize that it was the human birthright. You don't have to be a Buddhist. Every culture on earth has a wisdom tradition. What you have to do is know that it's there and you have to be willing to attend it. And so it was a completely different universe and I felt I ought to cover it. Mm. And it's is that a long enough answer? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the other... Uh, remarkable thing about this book and where it really differs significantly uh, from Sleeping Where I Fall is that you have, it's, it's almost a, almost like On the Road or Huck Finn, there's the sense of trying to deal with an absent, a very present, very powerful, very frightening father who marked your life throughout it and you're really trying to come to terms with that in this book and maybe you could talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah. So, we tend to forget now, but in the 20s and 30s and 40s in the United States, it was, there was a great deal of anti-Semitism. Even when I was growing up in the 40s and 50s, my family couldn't join the country club that was around the corner. And for a man like my dad, who went to MIT when he was 14, 15, 
who was a black belt in jiu-jitsu, who was um, Philadelphia Jack O'Brien's sparring partner, who was the first Caucasian Go player recognized by the Japanese. Really phenomenal man. He was tortured by that. He was tortured by the fact that, you know, people were looking down on him and um, that he, even in Wall Street where he worked, there were all sorts of rules that were set against him. And so he compensated for this both with a sense of rage and in a sense of mimicking a kind of English aristocratic life. He made a great deal of money, even though he died 20 million below broke for the 40s and 50s and 60s until he died. He was very, very wealthy. And he had lands and hounds and silken rugs and ran a museum quality American colonial antiques business. And, you know, and I never spent a weekend with him or went to a ball game or played catch with him or anything. And so it was a great gift to me because I saw that you couldn't make enough money to be happy. No one in my family was happy. He was a Demerol addict. So I had this violent, dangerous guy who was afraid that I was stupid or was afraid that I was going to be eaten by the world. And he thought the best thing he could do to help me was toughen me up. And he completely missed the little poetic boy that he had and set about toughening me up. So I had a great deal of rage, a great deal of anger to work out. All my time with the Hells Angels in the first book was spent working through that kind of stuff. And by the end of this book, I actually came to a kind of epiphany about him, which was that he was so uh, honest. And he was an exceptional man. He was a wonderful man. He was just a shitty father. He just couldn't just couldn't do it. He had no patience at all, and he got frightened if I couldn't multiply, do a word problem in my head, you know. But he made these incredible teachers available to me, each one of whom taught me something that he could have had he been able to. And so this book really, in its, in its structure, is all about mentors, various mentors from the world of love and power that were men and women, at least for the first half of it, that admired my father, were in my life because of their admiration for him, and my hunger for adult uh, appreciation and affection and guidance was such that I gl glommed onto them serially, and I have to give him credit for that, which was something that eluded me in my childhood. Mm. And after, the, and this, the book does a really a lovely job of, of paying uh, homage to a long line of these folks, including an Afri African-American lady who took care of you. Uh, when you, I guess it was when your mother had had a debilitating illness and she had to sort of step in. Uh, and then there were some just salt of the earth guys, like guys that worked on the ranch who you know you wouldn't think of as if a, a stranger walking by wouldn't think there was anything noteworthy about them, but they really made a profound impression on you. You know, one of the most blinding things about middle and upper class culture is that because we're given so much approbation for going to good schools and getting good grades and being told how smart we are, we so often miss wisdom when it's not in a package that we're used to. Uh, I used to have this friend named Hambone Tripp who was a Karak Indian, and he looked like he'd been beaten in the face with a shovel. <clears throat> he looked just like those guys you see holding a bottle of wine and a Gallo gift wrap on the sidewalk. You would have walked past him in a minute. But a profound man, the kind of man who could say to me one day, we were talking, he'd say, you know Pnefich. Pnefich was his nickname. It means coyote in Karak. He says, you know Pnefich. There's two kinds of people. He says, there's human beings and there's nobodies. And I said, what's the difference? He said, human beings care about other people. So I had these ranchers and farmers and game wardens and people that could do anything with metal, anything with their hands. They were creative problem solvers of an incredible order. And I was lucky enough to see it. I was not allowed to take shop. I was on a college track, you know. I would have loved to have taken shop. But I saw these people, and the black woman you referenced, still my mom today. I mean, I just abandoned my mom who had had 
a nervous breakdown when I was two and was unable to care for us for a couple of years. And this 17-year-old black girl from Henderson, North Carolina came into our family, just picked up all the troubles and threw them over her shoulder, and within three months was running the family, sending my father fleeing from the kitchen if he dared to raise his voice. <laughs> And, you know, my mom came back, but I had a lot of anger at her for not protecting me from my dad. And I didn't really become intimate with my mom till I was in my 30s. But Sue, Sue Nelson, was my mom and still today. She's 90 today and still the loudest woman in North America. <laughs> <laughs> Another, uh, maybe in some ways, the key mentor figure in the book, though, is somebody that I think your, your father had nothing to do with you meeting except uh, indirectly, perhaps by imparting to you uh, this thirst for wisdom or for reconciliation or for something, and that's the, uh, the poet Gary Snyder. And uh, maybe you could talk a little about the importance of your relationship with, with Gary Snyder. Sure. Well, I used to live on this commune in Olima, and one of my roommates was a great poet named Lou Welch who used to, used to get drunk a lot, and his wife Magda would throw him out, and he would come to the commune. And Great Lou Welch story, I just have to tell you. He was there one day. He had a bottle of uh, Almadin wine, a gallon bottle. And we were sitting around. It was one of those days we were making a lot of music. And we had conga drummers and fiddlers and flutists, and there was a girl named Carla, the most voluptuous 17-year-old mother on the planet, dancing bare-breasted in front of him. And Lou was completely gone. And at a certain point, he looked over at me and he said, the world's worst Persian voluptuary could not imagine our most ordinary day. And then he passed out. <laughs> so... That was Lou Welch, and Lou went to read with Gary Snyder. And so he kept telling me, you got to meet Gary. And Lou was important to me because my family was the diggers, and Lou was our forebears. He was one of the beats. And I felt that this conferred a kind of respect on us and a kind of... And there was actually an event in North Beach one night when Gary and Lou and Allen Ginsberg kind of passed the torch to the diggers. But he kept talking about Gary Snyder and arranged an introduction one day, and Gary came to visit in uh, a brand new Volkswagen camper, which I thought was incredibly bourgeois. I just, <laughs> you know, we were like hard scrabble buying trucks out of the junkyard and spending six months making them run. We had no money. Anyway, so I sat down and I waited for Gary to question me about my revolutionary values and my ideas and Basically, what he did was serve peanut butter on crackers, and we chatted a little bit. But at a certain point, I looked up at him, and he was looking at me just nakedly, like, who is this guy? And it was completely unsettling. It just sort of unmanned me. And uh, we said goodbye, and he left, and I was really, I had to admit, I was not, kind of knocked off my game. So I got curious about him. And then over time, I began to go up to the Sierras and work with him. And the first thing I noticed was he was the first person I met that was not unevenly developed. Most people are unevenly developed. You know, you have a talent that the culture promotes. I say, imagine being born with a huge bicep. And they go, oh, what a bicep that is. We can make your fortune with that bicep. That bicep will be on the cover of magazines. He's got the biggest bicep in the world. But the Zen perspective would be to say, nice bicep. Now let's get the rest of the body up to that perspective. Let's, let's bring it all up to there. So Gary was the first person that I met that did everything to the same meticulous level of concentration that he did anything. And I had never actually seen that. My dad was a guy who, if he cared about something, he knew everything about it. But if he didn't, he'd say, I don't know anything about it. And he had no curiosity about it. So I began to study with, with Gary just as we were working together. He's not a, a teacher. But we would just work together. And we would talk about stuff. And um, he was definitely not a father figure. 
but he was the most learned person that I had ever been, you know, wielding a chainsaw with, for instance. And um, when I understood that there was a connection between his scholarship and his approach to life and Buddhism, that's when I began to really look at spirituality and Buddhism differently. Mm, interesting. There, uh, let's change gears slightly to talk about something a little, a little higher philosophical plane, which is this occasion. Higher than right? Buddhism? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, actually, let, let me rephrase that. Uh, not higher, but a different one. Uh, but it actually uh, does have to do with, with Zen and also with the 60s. And, with, and it has something to do with y your... It interested me that you said that your first three drafts of this book were, you know, very political, very angry, hammering the points home uh, about, you know, how outrage, you know, is necessary and we've got to, you know, take action, which is actually the way that the first book ends. I, you have a quote in there where you say, I wish that people would get up in outrage and get into the streets again and take action against injustice. And I'm just interested in this because uh, in the course of the new book, when you're talking uh, uh, beautifully and writing with great subtlety and ambiguity and not, not sort of woo-woo-y cliches about, about Zen, but there's one passage when you're talking about uh, one, of, uh, one of your father's friends who was a real human shark. Um, I think it was Harry. And, and, it, and at the end of the book, you learn that Harry actually like killed two men um, who were trying to take over his burlesque theater. And you have a line there where you say, I don't, I don't judge Harry any more than I would judge a Bengal tiger. Like this was his nature to be like that. And that just, that opened up an interesting train of thought for me. I don't know what the answer is, but it, it concerns this uh, venerable, uh, I guess, tension in Zen itself between quietism and political engagement, um, in which, you know, if you're not s supposed to harm any, any living being, but then there's injustice in the world that requires practical action, is that something that is a tension with, that is difficult to reconcile for you? As a, and Peter is a Zen priest and has been, you know, deeply committed to this practice for 40 years. So I, I just I ask this in all humility because I, I know that both sides of this are in you know deep in your character. You were involved in major personal and political efforts to change the world, and Zan certainly does not advocate against that. But there is that aspect of looking at everything and seeing. Uh, it's, uh, I guess there's a technical word that isn't translated properly as emptiness. Actually, it just means that the sort of the passing show beyond which is a, is a deeper reality. Uh, anyway, I'm just throwing that out there to see if that's something that you've, you know. <laughs> right, that you've, well, right. Let's start with emptiness. Right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> emptiness is a problematical word for Westerners because we confuse it with nothing. Emptiness is not nothing. Emptiness refers to formlessness. It refers to the pregnant energy that is not manifested as any form. And it's pretty easily accessible to realize that this entire world arises and disappears, and it comes from the invisible. If you, if you imagine yourself on a cliff overlooking a choppy ocean, <clears throat> Little waves rise and fall and rise and fall just like our lives do. They come into shape, they come into existence for a while, and they go back into the ocean. And the thing that they forget and that we forget is that they've never not been part of the ocean. And we've never not been part of all of it. We've never been not been part of oxygen, of sunlight, of microbes in the soil that produce the food we eat, of pollinating insects, of hummingbirds. And all of that is manifested from the formless. So everything that comes to us when we get off our meditation pillow, which is where we get the closest to the formless, and we let our ideas and we let our personality soften, and we kind of soak ourselves in emptiness, as soon as we stand up and we come into this world, we are in the temporal, everyday world of duality, and we struggle with duality. But we can remember 
that both sides of a duality come from the same common denominator. So there's a huge difference between arguing with someone where you assume that you're good and he's evil. You assume that you're right and he's wrong. That's one way, that's the way most people do it. But if you actually realize that you're arguing with someone that is, has equal standing to you, the argument is different. It's much more respectful. It's much more understanding that that person, for whatever reason, is expressing their nature, which is Buddha nature, which is coming from emptiness, and it has equal standing whether you like it or not. So one of the, one of the difficulties is, you know, if people will say, well, if you had a chance to, to kill Hitler, would you? Maybe. But you'd have to accept the karma then of being a killer. You never get away from the consequences. So having lived through the 60s, well, first, having grown up in a family with a lot of communists and socialists and revolutionaries, Stalinists and Trotskyites, and watched those wonderful people who gave their life to various humanistic goals that I still support, but watching how they were tarnished by and malformed by Stalin, by the Viet Minh, by the Viet Cong, who were killing other Vietnamese by burying them alive because they wouldn't waste a bullet on them when they wouldn't support the revolution the way that they saw it. And then having looked through the promise of the 60s, having lived through the promises of Czechoslovakia, having lived through Rwanda, having lived through um, the Arab Spring, you start to see a certain pattern that human beings themselves are the problem. And that unless you can accept that your human nature is empty, is boundless, that you have the capacity to be Mother Teresa or the Dalai Lama or Hitler. And if you don't know that, you won't be on guard for it. So the guys that create all the damage in the world are the guys that say, we're the good guys, and what we do is good, and we never look back. And we never look at the consequences of having, quote unquote, privatized Iraq and firing the entire Ba'athist army, who's now ISIS. So we don't look at that because we just think we're good. But if you actually accept that being a human being, you are a very, very dangerous person, and that you require monitoring. And if you monitor yourself, then you can be alert when anger arises, when jealousy arises, when vengefulness arises. So my experience has been that when people change on that level, they never change back. William Crystal used to be a leftist. This one used to be a leftist. This one used to be a rightist. He's now doing conservative exposés. That's all on the level of ideas. That's not on the level of what is your fundamental intention, your self, your persona is making a request from you. And if you understand what it is, you will be in absolute concord with the universe, and you'll be doing exactly what it is you're supposed to do. And it won't be what I'm doing. It won't be organized by ideology. It'll be organized by your authentic being in touch with your innermost nature. So to me, my lineage founder came here in 1960 and began sitting Zazen in a garage. And now there are hundreds of thousands of Buddhists of every stripe all over the United States. Now, we may not like the time frame. You know, we might think, well, we're running out of time. We got to do something. The time frame may be centuries. That's not for me to say. The alternatives, the political alternatives, have caused as much suffering as they've attempted to cure on every side. So given my limited time span on Earth, I've decided to try to do something that won't involve making me a murderer, that does seem to, to change people in a way where they won't back up and change again. Because when you've had a fundamental experience of emptiness and your own nature, you don't abandon it again. 
So there is, to me, there's no inherent tension between the political, the social, the spiritual. They're all products of Buddha nature. What you have to decide is, how can I operate in a way that's consistent of doing no harm, practicing kindness? It's why Buddhists block nuclear power plants with their bodies, but they don't throw things. They don't attack the police with stones because the police are expressing their nature as well. It's not just simple political analysis. Mm. Wow, great, great, uh, great discussion. <laughs> Let's see how we're doing on time because we want to leave a uh, little time for uh, the audience to ask some questions. I think maybe it is that time. It's about uh, 20 of, uh, should we? I'll uh, turn it over to uh, questions from the audience. Yeah. How do you feel approaching old age? <laughs> the question was, how do you feel approaching old age? Well, you know, I'm sort of a witness to the changes going on in my body. Some of them are good. I'm free of the hep C virus for the first time in 45 years. That, liberates a lot of energy. That's a product of Western capitalistic medicine I once would have pissed on. But after I almost died twice from, you know, medicines, this cured me in 12 weeks. So I, I hope I would like to live long enough to see my granddaughter become more who she is. She's nine now. Um, I'd like to see how things come out. But Really, you know, so there's a visible world and there's an invisible world. And if we put all of our allegiance and faithfulness on the visible world, we have to be terrified because the entire visible world is going to disappear. But the invisible world doesn't change at all. The invisible world is like the ocean. The waves rise and fall. There's a wonderful YouTube lecture by Suzuki Roshi about the waterfall where he talks about uh, a waterfall and a drop of water coming from the river and falling free and going down and joining the river again at the bottom. And he says, that little drop of water is like our life. Before it was individuated, it was the river. And then it has a free fall for a while, and then it's the river again. So I try to split my loyalty. And um, I'm not saying that I would not be... Um, sorry to leave this veil of tension and duality and all of that stuff. But I'm also in touch with another part that's not going anywhere and didn't come from anywhere. And um, that's available as an alternative. And it, it's a pretty good antidote to fear. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so I didn't exactly choose it. I was sort of pushed into it. When I was uh, in just about 20 or 21, I was at school in the Midwest, and a bunch of us sent to Laredo, Texas, to Moore's Orchid Farm, and we bought a box about as big as long stem roses come in of peyote, a lot of peyote. <laughs> and uh, we opened it up, and there were these thick, succulent cactus in there, and we didn't have a clue. But we were college students, so we went to the library, and we, <laughs> we started to study. And in one of the articles that we read, um, they mentioned the Tama Indian Reservation, which was near Grinnell College. So we drove over to Tama, and I've all, always had a lucky knack of finding the person that I needed to find. And I met this Indian dude over there who knew exactly what it was, so we gave him half of the peyote, and he told us how to take the little cotton tufts out of it and how to take it. So about six of us retired to uh, uh, a room, and we ate about eight buttons each, which <laughs> really enough to tranquilize a large horse. <laughs> and nothing happened. We were just sitting there. And then my friend Terry Bisson, who actually edited this book, a wonderful writer from Oakland, great novelist, he stood up and he said, well, I'm going back to my room. This is, hey, my hands are dizzy. <laughs> and it, 
And as soon as he said that, the whole room levitated. It was like... <laughs> <clears throat> so we went outside, and I was, I was really out of it. And I turned to Terry, and he reminded me of this almost 40 years later. I turned to him, and I said, you know, Terry, this is weird, man, but I'm some kind of little wolf or something. I, I got, I'll see you later. And <laughs> I spent the entire night dog-trotting through the cornfields of Iowa, like, <laughs> and then wetting my nose. And then when my nose was wet, I could really smell. And I woke up in the morning in the field, and in the mud were all these little prints. And I was so loaded, I didn't know if I'd made them or not. I don't know how they got there. So I filed that story. And then about three years later, I was living out in uh, Carlin, Nevada, Four years later, I was living in Carlin, Nevada with a Cherokee Shoshone uh, shaman named Rolling Thunder who had come to the Haight-Ashbury. He'd had a vision that the diggers were the reincarnated spirits of Indians who were killed at Little Bighorn. Might have been bullshit, but it was good bullshit. <laughs> I liked it. I was a digger. So, And he was an amazing guy. He had a lot of power, and he was maybe a third carny salesman, you know, hustler, but a lot of juice. So I went to live with him, fixing his car, fixing his toilets, just doing stuff to be around him, see what I could pick up. And one day we were having a smoke. He let me use his Indian tobacco. And I told him this story. And he sat up straight and he looked at me and he said, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, look, the universe opened its mind to you. He said, you can dismiss it as a hallucination, and you can stay a white man, and you'll have an ordinary life. That's okay. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. He said, or you could dedicate yourself to trying to understand what it means and become a human being. <laughs> so I thought about it for a couple months, and I took the name as a uh, first step to trying to figure out what it meant to honor this thing. And it had an unintended consequence I hadn't anticipated, which was very lucky. By stepping out of my old identity as Peter Kohan, which was known and triangulated by my family, my relatives, my, my friends, I had a bulletproof personal history known to them. By stepping into Peter Coyote, I had no history, not even for myself. And I was completely liberated into the moment. And so I was, about, I was about 25 then. I'm 73 today. So I've been Peter Coyote three times longer than I was Peter Kohan. But that's how it happened. Uh, yeah. Oh, narrating and, and doing documentaries. Well, when I worked for Jerry Brown for eight years, and when I, when I the, the counterculture kind of fell apart and times changed, I was a single father of a daughter. I'd just given up a, almost a 12-year drug habit, and I had to make a living. And I had a big success working on the Arts Council. It was one of Jerry's model programs. And it gave me a lot of confidence. And I'd been an actor in college. And I thought, I'll give myself five years to try it. And if I don't do it, I won't die with the what ifs. But maybe I'll be lucky. And so to start, I still had to make money. So I made a, uh, I made a CD of myself talking in all sorts of voices and accents about what a scurrilous rascal Peter Coyote was, <laughs> you know, like my grandfather. I wouldn't put that boy in a room with a woman. He'll jump on her like a kangaroo. <laughs> I had 20 different people talking, and I, I printed it up, and I brought it around to every ad agency in San Francisco, and it made people laugh, and I actually started to get work doing voiceovers and things like that. And then when I got a little notoriety, you fall into a category called celebrity voiceovers, which is where you're not exactly endorsing the, the program, but your voice is recognizable. And people go, 
oh, wait a minute, that's Gene Hackman in United Airlines. Oh, that's, that's so-and-so on doing Volvo. And that's really lucrative. That's when you're into the kingdom of the overpaid, <laughs> which was really lucky for me because I didn't get my Screen Actors Guild card till I was 39. And I had to, you know, buy a house, get my kids through school and save for their college education and stuff. So I had a good run for a number of years. So I just, I love documentaries and it became an extension of my political work that people who were doing good work could come to me and they, after a while you find out you're on every sucker list in the United States for anybody doing a movie about a good cause. And I would just say, okay, I'll narrate it. If you sell it, well, you can pay me a fee. If you don't, it's just an hour of my time. And then I met Ken Burns' people, and um, are you telling us it's time to go? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> I met Ken Burns' people, and there we were. Well, we, yes, I'd, thanks. It's here for Peter Coyote. Thanks.